still kind of maybe starting out with a little bit of an Olympic theme because, you know, there's some people in the Olympics, obviously they've been working and training and even straining to get to the point in their life where they're ready to participate, to compete, and maybe even to win. And I'm thinking most people, they would like to win. <laughs> you know, it'd, it'd just be kind of interesting. There's many different countries involved. So let's just say you're really into the 100 meter and that's kind of your race and you're at the Olympics and you know your time is nowhere near, almost hardly even a qualifying time, but you're there to represent your com country and so you're just maybe glad to be there. But there's some people that have really been competing and, and they've been working at it and they've been training on teams and coaching and, and, but you know, they had a lot of anticipation. They've been thinking about this. They've been dreaming about this. And especially since last year, they maybe were supposed to be participating and that fell through. Now they're finally here. A lot of anticipation and really a lot of waiting. And we know sometimes waiting is the difficult part, waiting to actually be a part of it. And we know what that's like. Either we remember from our childhood or maybe from our parenting when we're younger. Hey, we have a great idea. Let's take the whole family and the kids down to Disney in Florida. Won't that be fantastic? Now, we're going to drive in the car, which is quite the experience just to get there, isn't it? I mean, it's quite the, you know, it's a ride, just like they have rides at Disney. But because, you know, what, what do children say? Because they're all thinking, I'm excited, I just want to be there. And they say, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And generally, kids start asking the question as you're backing out of the driveway. <laughs> right? It's just like over and over and over again. And eventually, you hear mom and dad saying, are we there yet? <laughs> you know, these kids are trying to even... Like, this is before the kids had tablets and games and all that stuff. I mean, they didn't even have the, the little VCR thing there going on, you know, on the seat in front of them. They, you know, they actually had to come up with their own stuff to do for, what, 20 hours? But waiting. I mean, the anticipation. But you know, the funny thing about life is, no matter what you do, and, and you know what it's like to anticipate something. Maybe you were anticipating buying something you really wanted, anticipating that new job, and when you get, finally get the new job, you're anticipating retirement. But think about retirement for a minute. I mean, some people may only be a few months away from retirement, and so for them, retirement can be pretty exciting because the anticipation and the wait is fairly short at this time. But think about somebody that's 23 and a half years old, and you say, hey, you just got to keep working, and, and one day you'll be retired. And that just seems like forever away. It was never going to come. So sometimes waiting is difficult. Waiting is challenging. Now, the Bible talks about us waiting. And sometimes it's talking about waiting on God or waiting for something to happen, or waiting for our eternal home. And maybe, again, depending on where we are in life, the waiting can be a challenge, the anticipation. And really, as I was thinking about it this week, there's, there's kind of a progression. It kind of starts with faith. You have to have faith. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God because whoever comes to God must believe that he exists. That's part of faith. We just believe that he's there. He, he's God. We believe in him. But the verse goes on to say, and that God rewards those who earnestly seek him. Now that's, that's quite a different faith. It's not just believing that there is a God or believing in God, you actually believe God. You believe that what he said is true. And so now this faith leads into something else. It leads into trust. Not only do I believe in him, but now I trust him. I trust that what he said is true. I trust it's going to happen. I trust he will deliver on the promise. I not only believe in God, I trust him. But not only do you believe that leads to trust, but the trust now leads to hope. I hope. And, and the, the hope is not just, well, you know, I got my fingers crossed, hope it's going to happen. It's actually believing in the future that what God has promised is going to happen, and I'm going to be a part of that experience. 
I'm going to be a part of that promise. I'm going to receive what he's promised. And so here's the hope that we have. All right, so we have faith growing into trust. Trust goes into, grows into hope. And hope grows into waiting. Waiting. We're going to wait for something. So I just want to look at a few verses that may help us, because what I'm really thinking about is looking forward to the ultimate promise, the kingdom of God, the heaven that God has promised those people that follow him. And ultimately, I think that's why we're Christians, not to get to, not really just to get to a place. I mean, heaven's going to be a nice place, but we want to get to the relationship. Like, we don't want to just get to heaven because God built it. We want to get to the builder. Like, we want to be with God. Do you understand that? I mean, it's one thing to be a parent and to see that your children really do like you because you're able to provide things for them. Well, that's okay. It kind of grows old after a while when you think all you are is a thing provider. My kids only like me for what I can give them. I wonder if they like me at all. Do they like me? And that's what this is, the looking forward to being with God. And so this is the hope to which we look. But sometimes we have challenges even here on the earth. And that's where the psalmist, you know, there's a few psalms that, that speak about this, looking forward. This first one, you know, just think about this. Early in the morning, you hear my voice. How does God hear my voice early in the morning? Because I'm talking to him. Early in the morning, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to communicate with God. And it seems like he's letting God know how he feels and what he thinks and even the desires of his heart. And so early in the morning, he speaks to God and God hears. God cares. God's listening. And in the morning, I lay my requests before you. Look what he does. And I wait. Expectantly. Not only do I just wait, I wait in anticipation. I want to wait with hope. I want to wait with trust. Like, that's the way we ought to be praying. God, I'm going to pray to you. I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I believe that God has the best solution, the best plan, the best ideas on my behalf, that he's going to work things out. And it may not always be as I think or as I want. So I pray to him in expectation. I don't know how God's going to work this out. It may be what I want, and it may be not what I want, but either way, God's working it out. And God's going to be with me whether I rejoice for good news or whether I'm crying because there's disappointment. But I still trust. I'm expecting eagerly for God to work. And my faith grows through that. And that's the idea of us looking towards God, knowing that he is able, and knowing that he is willing, and knowing that he's all loving, and he's kind, but he's also got a plan, an overall plan. We don't always see that. And sometimes it's working through the plan that's difficult. I mean, it's almost like just being in the car, and you're not there yet. And after a while, the car ride does get a little monotonous, or it gets a little annoying. And we just kind of want that part to be over. But we know there's something much better in the future. God has something planned for us. Another verse in Psalm, verse 33, chapter 33, verse 20. Listen to the words, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. So we're just communicating with God how we feel. We got struggles, and we got maybe some doubts, maybe even a little bit of fear. But God, I trust you, I'm going to hope in you, and I'm believing in you. And you know God is worthy to be believed in. And this is the idea of having a strong hope. Something that you can really put everything into. Because there's nothing else in life that's quite like that, is there? You know, think about the Olympics. I know you've probably not thought about them in a long time. 
the Olympics. People have spent a long time planning, training, and hoping to win the Olympics. But there's going to be some people there. Their hope is going to be dashed. Because not only did they not get the gold, they didn't even stand on a podium. And they really thought, I had a chance. This is what I've been working for. I believed in this. And now they've got a sinking feeling, kind of a sickening feeling, an empty feeling. I did all this for what? Because they didn't get what they thought they were going to get. But you want to know something else? There's some people in the Olympics, and they're going to win the gold medal. And that's something they've been dreaming of and hoping for and planning and training, putting all their effort in, and they've won the gold. And you know what they're going to feel after a while? I did all that for this? Like, what is this? What did it really give me in my life? Oh, a few minutes of applause, a little bit of standing on, and I got, you know, a piece of metal I can wear around my neck. But I thought it was going to be some kind of eternal joy. I thought it was going to be something in my life that was meaningful. I thought it was going to be something that would last. And many of them are going to have great disappointment because I thought being a winner was going to change my life. In reality, it changed very little. Enough momentarily. I mean, I appreciate all the effort, they, and I appreciate their... their Athletic ability, I mean, it's just amazing. It's wonderful. But it's probably not what they ever dreamt of, what it would be like to actually win. Yeah, standing on the podium, getting a few shots, that, uh, pictures. <laughs> you know, it's great momentarily. You know, it's kind of like what Solomon said. Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes that God has put in, in, the, in the heart of man eternity. There's something inside of us that, that is hoping for something, that's looking, that's longing for something much bigger than anything in this world. I'm looking for something that's going to last. I'm going to look for some hope that's got some real substance to it. You remember Solomon? He's saying, well, I'm going to put my hope in money. I'm going to put my hope in friends. I'm going to put my hope in women. I'm going to put my hope in music. I'm going to put my hope in gardening. Really? And I'm going to put my hope in being smart and being famous. I got, he's putting his hope in a lot of different areas. And every time he's like, it's just, it's just not worth it. It's not worthy of me putting my whole life and everything I am and all of my, all of my hope into this worldly pursuit. There's something bigger. It's heavenly. This is the hoping in God because he's the one who is eternal. That is going to protect us. He's going to be our shield. And in God, we, we find rejoice day after day. It's not just a temporary thing. And God's unfailing love is with us. And so we put all of our hope and our trust and our faith in him. In Psalm 119, I wait for your salvation, Lord. I follow your commands. I obey your statutes for I love them greatly. Again, it's this idea of waiting patiently. I wait for your salvation. That's what we want to talk about. Being saved. Sometimes in the Old Testament, the book of Psalms, you know, sometimes the being saved, it is a temporary thing. It's like I want to be saved from my enemies. I want to be saved from the sin of the world. I want to be saved from temptation and the devil working. I want to be saved here in this world. But David had a greater picture of salvation, and that is in an eternal home, looking forward to being with God. I'm just reminded all the time, maybe because I do a few funerals once in a while, Psalm 23. Remember how it ends? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what I'm thinking about. That's what I pray about. That's what I dream about. That's where my hope is. I just want to be there in God's presence, in his place, in his city, in his home. I want to be there with him. That's my hope. It's not in this world. This world's going to disappoint. This world cannot fulfill. This world does not have lasting peace or love or joy. I wait for your salvation. 
In Psalm 130, verse 5, and then skipping down to verse 7, I wait for the Lord with my whole being. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. Israel, put your hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. I like the word, full redemption. It's just not partial, it's just not temporary. It's everything you could imagine it would be, full redemption. That's what our hope is. And so even the Old Testament, they had this idea in their mind of we're looking for something much better. You remember Hebrews talks about people like Abraham and, and even Moses, that although they followed God in faith and they were looking forward to the promise, the biggest promise they were looking for was a heavenly kingdom, a house not made with hands, a city that God had built. Because if they'd been looking for something in this world, they would have turned around and gone back home. But no, they're looking for something bigger than anything that you can find in this world. This is where their faith, trust, and hope were, and so that's why they continued to wait with endurance. So we get to Romans chapter 8, where the Bible reading was taken from, and this really points directly to this hope that we have of, of something being made new, kind of starting all over again, kind of the way God originally intended it to be. The, the, the creation waits in this eager expectation. It's kind of interesting when he talks about the creation waiting. I mean, what is this creation he's talking about? Is it just Christians? I would say we probably don't have non-Christians waiting in eager expectation. Is it the angels that they're waiting in eager expectation? Or is it the whole world itself? Today we would even say even that the animal kingdom that... Maybe somehow they understand the world is broken, not, certainly not at the level we can, but they just realize something's not right. It's not functioning the way God had planned it from the very beginning. In case you haven't noticed, it's not the Garden of Eden anymore. We're living in a broken world. And now uh, creation is eagerly waiting. We want redemption. We want something new. We want salvation and so, in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For this all to be over, and then the children of God are back in this place of paradise. Kind of the way God wanted it to be. Remember, God walked with Adam and Eve. Personal relationship. In the cool of the garden. In the perfect world. But look what it's saying. It waits in eager expectation. It's just kind of an interesting question. I mean, if you, if you thought in your life, or if somebody asked you, what is the thing that you are really looking forward to? I mean, what is the thing that you live for? What is the thing that you are just so eager? I mean, I just want the one thing, the biggest thing. I mean, maybe there's a few things, but what's the biggest thing that you really want in, in life? What is it that really drives you? What is it that makes you, you? What makes you different maybe than others? What is your hope? Number one. What's the number one hope? Well, you know, people can say all kinds of things. Why, well, you know, I'd like to have peace on earth. Well, that's what you say at Christmas. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to be better physically. You know, maybe I'm sick. I wish I was happy. I wish I had a better job. I wish I had a job. I wish I could retire from my job. I want things to be better in my family. I'd like to get finished with school and get on with life. I mean, there's all kinds of things we can really look for. But, but this is saying, no, the number one thing is I'm looking for salvation, redemption. I'm looking for everything to be new. Not just like a new address or a new roommate or a new workplace. It's bigger than that. That, that, that's just a little something new. But we all know, listen, the, the neighborhood you live in, I, I know it's, go, it's going downhill. Now, some of you just moved to an uphill. But anyway, it's not, it's not what it used to be, the neighborhood. But you move from your neighborhood to another neighborhood, and there's going to be some lousy neighbors in that neighborhood, too. And your workplace, when you move from the workplace you're in now, because you don't like it, to that new workplace where everything's going to be fabulous and everybody's going to be wonderful. That's not going to happen either. And I mean, how many people in the world say, well, I'm going to leave this spouse and I'm going to get married to somebody else because I'm going to be happier over there. Well, listen, 
it's not worked out the last six times you've done that. The problem's not with that person. The problem's with you. I mean, either you're a really poor choice of choosers of people, or else you've got some issues going on. That's not going to get better. But what are we looking for? Everything new. Everything's different. Everything's right. Everything's perfect. Everybody gets along. Everybody is kind, loving, humble, serving. Everybody worships God. And as far as what we think of the physical, there's no more crying or pain or death or sorrow or sickness. There's no, none of the challenges we have in this life because you're going into a place, well, that's what I'm eager for. That's what I want. And, and as a Christian, if that's not motivating us, no wonder we get dragged down by the world. No wonder we're an easy target for Satan to attack. Because we're caught up in all the stuff of the world. Now, listen, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Why? Philippians 3, Bible class today, our citizenship is not in this world. Our citizenship is in heaven where we eagerly wait for the Lord to return. We're eager. We're ready. We're excited. This is what we dream about. This is what we're working. Just, again, the Olympic athlete, just as they have been so focused and, and, and clear and dedicated to their sport. In the same way, that's, that's all we ever seem to think about. That's all we ever seem to talk about. That's all we ever seem to do. During the day, we're just thinking about the kingdom of God. Because that's what we're working towards. So the creation is eagerly waiting. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly. So that's kind of where we are right now. We're living in this world. We've got pain. We've got struggles. And we've got tears. And we've got a heartache. But we eagerly wait. Or you can say we wait eagerly. For the adoption of the sonship, the redemption of our bodies. So again, it's, you know that's not going to happen in this world. I don't know if you've noticed. You probably haven't, but I'm getting older, right? Like, I came here 14 years ago. I was here as a young man, very young, right? But I'm getting older every day. Anybody else, right? So we're not thinking things are going to get better. We think we're kind of, you know, struggling a little bit more than we used to. But this is saying redemption of everything about life. It's physical bodies, spiritual bodies, it's, it's going to be all brand new. A heavenly body. That's what we're looking for. But look what he, the, again, the, the illustration, the words are, wait eagerly. And that's kind of what we're focused on, just having this anticipation of what God has planned for us. If we hope for what we do not yet have, but we wait patiently. So again, I mean, what's Romans 8? This is the third time in Romans 8, just talking about looking forward. Eager, patient. We're waiting for what God's going to do. And I think that changes our perspective of life. It changes how we live life, how we respond to life. It, it, it changes the way we live every day, the way we treat people, the way we get along in our families, the way we act at the workplace, the way we perhaps even respond to people in traffic. Whatever it would be, changes everything about us. Because we're not focused on this world. We're focused on something much better. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, which is kind of interesting. We're studying 1 Corinthians in Tuesday. You know, it's kind of interesting that sometimes we uh, study stuff and it just seems to come up quite often in lessons, not only in the Bible class, but sermons and things like that. Think about this for one minute. If you could think of one messed up church in the New Testament, forget that. If you could think of one messed up church out of all the churches that you have ever known, ever read about, whether it's in history, whether it's current time, no matter what church, if you could find a church more messed up than Corinth, I'd like to know about it. But these guys, brothers and sisters in Christ in Corinth, have issues. Many issues. Problems, struggles, sin, false teaching. They're all over the place. 
But look what he says to these people. And it's, of course, chapter 1, which means it's a little hint. It's at the beginning. And he's trying to set their mind, focus on this, think about who you are in Christ. We can get to the issues and what's going on. Who are you in Christ? It's going to change everything. Because when Paul starts trying to correct them, it's going to be obvious. Well, that's not who I am in Christ. I mean, that's not, it's not even godly. I want to I live in Christ because that's who I am. That's how I've been called. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Seems like all the issues they have, I couldn't imagine any of them at the forefront of their mind. They think, hey, I want to wait for Jesus to come back. Most of them would say, I'm not ready for Jesus to come back. My life's a mess. I don't, you know, I'm just way off. Listen, we live in this anticipation, eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. Got to tell you the truth. If I was talking or writing to the Corinthian church, this is the last thing I would write, right? That you will be blameless on the day of Christ. It's like you guys are already so way off base and way off track and way off anything God. But you know what he's saying? If God has saved you and you're forgiven and you're living for him, yeah, you've made a lot of mistakes, but you can come right back. And not everyone is guilty. There's still some people that are faithful. They're still going to be held firm, held in place. They're going to be called blameless through Jesus Christ. So not only are we reminded of the future, but we're also reminded of their past. Because a lot of these people at Corinth, they could never in and of themselves say they're blameless. But Jesus Christ can say, I came and I died for you so that your sin would become a part of me and my righteousness would become a part of you. And so today you stand blameless because Jesus took all of our blame upon himself when he was on the cross. He became sin for us to redeem us from this world. And that's not only just forgiveness, that's really saying he's going to give you a new life, a new start, a new plan, and a new hope. But you, dear friends, by building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in God's love as you wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to bring you to eternal life. That's our prayer. That is a church. We work together. We love each other. We encourage each other as we grow in our faith. Maybe you've never become a Christian. You've never surrendered your life to Christ. You're still living for all the hope that's in this world, which really, maybe you haven't noticed it yet, but one day you would notice that it really amounts to nothing. It's temporary. And generally, even when it comes around, it's not as big or nice or fulfilling as you ever thought it would be. But there's something that can deliver that emptiness in your heart. The longing for eternity, the longing for something bigger than this life, bigger than me, bigger than anything I could ever become of myself. It's all found in Christ Jesus. And if today you want that forgiveness that we just talked about, that he, Jesus Christ took our sins when he was on the cross, and he gives us his righteousness that we could be saved, we could go to heaven, our sins forgiven, and the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us because we've been redeemed, and if today you want to choose that life, to say, I'm not going to live for myself anymore, I'm going to live for God. I'm not going to be focused on this world, I'm going to be focused on God's kingdom. I'm not going to be doing things according to the, the rule and the law of the world, but according to what God has said for me to do. And I want that new life in Christ. And if that's what you want, to make Jesus the Lord of your life, and to turn from this world, to turn to him, you can be baptized today to participate in the death and the burial and resurrection of Christ. So your sins would be forgiven. You receive the gift of the Spirit, and you become a part of God's kingdom. If we can encourage you in any way in your Christian walk, we're going to stand, we'll sing this song, Only a Step, and you can let us know how we can be a blessing to you today.